Now, we're currently working on a forthcoming publication that we titled We Roma, looking at how Roma knowledges can actually inform us about possibilities in, the, in this uh, contemporary moment. And there's a remarkable interview um, that I made with um, a Roma uh, curator and writer, Tima Junghaus, who is based in Budapest and does incredibly interesting work with Roma artists and intellectuals. And any time I would go dreaming about the possibility of bringing Roma knowledge to the surface, um, or better said, perhaps into the center of our considerations today, she would immediately warn me with reality check, saying that mine, in fact, is absolutely idealistic scenario. And if we really look at what's happening um, in Europe at this moment, you see poverty, you see oppression, you see genocide when it comes to, to Roma community. And we need to take these warning signs extraordinarily seriously. Somewhere at the ground of this whole thing is our stereotypes about Roma people uh, amongst us. That I think that's precisely what uh, Ethel and Daniel in their uh, conversation performance um, will try to um, expose and deconstruct and speak to us and speak with us about the possibilities ahead. Thank you so very much for joining us. We'd like a couple of volunteers from the audience to participate in a short um, performance. So cross my palms with silver and I'll tell your fortune. Cross our palms with silver and we'll tell your fortune. Come. So if you come this side, you go that way with this lady. Do you have money? Yeah. How much? Change. Would you come over here, please? Okay. Coins, mm -hmm. So I'm going to do a tarot reading for you. So if you sit here. Give me a little bit more okay. if you want. Are you happy to do the tarot reading? I'm not okay. giving, oh, don't give okay. me, don't give me dollars. I mean, don't give me euros. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is yeah. fine. All right. Thank you. So, if you think of a question, you don't have to tell me what the question is. Okay. But um, you can, you can tell me or you, you don't have to tell me. Okay. May I see your hand? Okay. So, if you shuffle those cards for a while. It's quite pink and warm. It, it's healthy. You've, I think you've been living healthily and you're living in
What happens when marginal practices <coughs> are brought to the center? How do the aesthetics of these practices inform perceptions of Roma? My interest is in productive practices, in marginalized or object forms of labor, and feminist subjectivity. I bring to this conversation my work as a feminist theorist, a sociologist, and an activist, and someone with a background in Marxist and post-Marxist theory, labor, work, and protest. I'm also a Romani American uh, and grew up with stories from my mother, my aunts, my other women relatives sitting outside, sitting in the house, and talking about peddling, buying and selling, making handicrafts, sometimes out of not much than what you'd find around, horse breeding and trading and racing, living with the horses, as my mother would say, and once in a while, very rarely dookering, fortune-telling. So while the men in our family, as I was growing up, were paving roads, tarmacking um, for a living, in earlier periods it was women's work that kept food on the table. And I would argue dis this really disrupts the myth of the male breadwinner. It re-centers gendered, racialized, and object labor practices. And it's precisely this gendered productivity and its marginalization that interests me. So the thoughts I'm exploring here this evening and um, that I uh, look at in my wider work are based on three um, areas. My experience of growing up as a Roman Gypsy in the UK. My interpretation of the official Roma histories that I've um, looked at through the various publications, um, usually written uh, by non-Roma. So this is the official uh, version of Roma histories. And the third area is Roma aesthetics from the starting point of Roma visual culture. So the question of Roma aesthetics as a means of visual and sensory communication becomes more important when we consider the absence of a literary history within Romani culture. Um, the family that I grew up in had no books at home, and I'm sure this is not unusual for, for lots of um, families. Um, the reason they had no books is because my parents couldn't read or write, and therefore all the acculturation and cultural narrative that circulated in the home was through the objects and artifacts that um, uh, decorated or were installed in the home. So this idea of, um, of decor as a primary importance to Roma, I think is very important. And it also denotes a, an absence from the idea of art as a, a locus of, um, of uh, social narrative and um, value. Therefore, value is held by the decor and the ornamentation of home and often of functional objects, thereby um, objects and tools used in the home performed multiple um, functions. They were um, there to provide an aid to any kind of work that was going on, but also a source of um, artistic nourishment. So my art practice and research have led me to the opinion that Roma aesthetics and Roma experience are intimate, intimately connected and mutually influential. And the point where these knowledges converge is what I'm interested in. So I'm suggesting that the elements that inform Roma aesthetics um, most readily apparent in Roma visual and material culture, these um, elements translate into universal preoccupations for Roma. A set of values which um, I refer to in a propositional gesture as the Roma model, which I'll talk a bit more about later. Um, 
So now I'm going to hand back over to Ethel. And we're going to begin our conversation now. That was our introduction. And I also want to say thank you all for sticking it out. You must be exhausted. So we really appreciate the fact that you're sitting here and listening to our conversation and hopefully taking part in it in some way. And the conversation is going to take the form of a kind of show and tell. Um, we prepared some. Oh, OK. Aren't we going to be? Yes. We've got our background. That's right. Yes, first. that's right. So before we show and tell, we're just going to start talking a little bit. Um, the first written reference to palm reading that I could find was in the laws of Manu, written somewhere between 500 and 200 BC. And by the way, a supremely anti-feminist text. You may or may not want to look at it um, in India, and one of the foundational texts of Hinduism. It's widely believed that Romani people brought it to Europe. Um, where it was documented as early as the 13th century. And along with the Romani language and the Marime Makardi rules of cleanliness, it's something that concretely ties us to India and marks our violent, perhaps, diasporic migration to Europe. Palm reading predates psychology, the Vienna School, psychotherapy, psychiatry, as well as modern cartography notions of predictability, scientific method, and medicine. And yet, I would argue, it combines all of those. And I would also argue that it marks us as cosmopolitan, as European, and often as other. So although we, Romani people, embrace our language, our abilities with Romanes, no matter what dialect we speak of it, we repudiate these very skills often that kept body and soul together, that provided a means of sustenance, and kept us as a people throughout a millennium in Europe, under adverse conditions and constant waves of attempt annihilation and beyond. So what would it mean to embrace palm reading and Romani women's abject labor? And I'm using abject very deliberately here. As part of our portable wealth, a legacy that we can use, that we can reclaim. So part of this re reclaiming would take up and deconstruct these practices, which have become at once, I was supposed to be talking to you. You can talk to all of us, it's fine. That would become at once pathologically embodied and disembodied in the present day. What would it mean to take these palmic cartographies and create other landscapes, other possibilities, and make them into handscapes? which is partly what we'll be exploring this evening. I'm going to talk um, very briefly about stereotypes and the possibility of symbols as um, productive alternatives. So while symbols are more likely to be self-assigned, stereotypes are, as we know, often imposed from the outside. Um, so in considering stereotypes and symbols of nomadism, um, of uh, Roma, let's say, um, let's consider an enduring Roma stereotype, which um, includes associations with threat, danger, and dishonesty, all of which are closely linked to the idea of nomadism as the rejection of societal, societal norms acted out through the suspect performance of elusive mobility. And um, key to this idea of nomadism viewed by the wider world is the central um, possibility of unaccountability. So if we're thinking of a nomadic group, we think about someone that can uh, behave in a particular way and move on with no, no comeback. That's the kind of the idea of um, a nomadic group which has recently been um, exploited through securitization throughout um, Europe with the idea that Roma are the current most pressing threat to national security rather than any other monetary or economic uh, problems that are occurring. So the idea of, of displacing the security threat onto Roma rather than any other more real threat 
seems to be quite a significant move at the moment for most um, governments. So, but in relation to this idea of nomadism, it's important to point out that not all Roma travel. In fact, the majority do not. So rather than dealing with the idea of nomadism as an actuality, as the idea of people in an itinerant situation, it's rather the symbol of nomadism that remains to inform Roma communities today. And this manifests itself in a legacy of nomadism, which I term the nomadic sensibility. So this is a, um, a sensibility, an inherent sensibility, which has been developed historically um, in relation to a sensitivity to, to the contingent, contingencies of life on the move. So, a sensitivity to the contingencies of life on the move, which has been passed down through, uh, through uh, the ages to today's Roma, and which I believe still persists to inform the Roma worldview. Um, this worldview, uh, with its starting point in a nomadic sensibility, often sets Roma groups apart from and in opposition to the nation state. Um, that's from one perspective. But if we look at this another way, this idea of a nomadic sensibility, the Roma worldview, also offers the ideal of an alternative to the status quo, of new ways of thinking and possibly new ways of being together. Now, these ideas have been explored previously um, through the uh, bohemianism and the, the avant-garde in the 18th century, um, qualities that, the, uh, that gypsies and Roma um, embodied during that period were taken up and valued by activists and intellectuals of the time to form the avant-garde. So if that's been appreciated before, then there's no reason why we can't look at Roma again with a more appreciative eye. So, um, so central to this idea of the nomadic sensibility is um, the quality of extraterritoriality. And this is where we start our show and tell. We both, Ethel and I have both made some cards or maps. I've made cards, symbols, and, Rome, and Ethel has made maps. So this is... Um, Following on from our short performance, um, with the idea that these prejudiced activities that uh, you witnessed earlier have some value as a starting point for looking at new formulations of Roman knowledge or new interpretations of Roman knowledge. So I'm going to begin with um, extraterritoriality, which is, I consider to be one of the um, main characteristics of what I termed as the Roma model before. So, um, so extraterritoriality, which is this card here, mm -hmm. Ethel, it, um, it, it's characterized by non-attachment. Mm -hmm. uh, non-attachment not only to geographies, but also non-attachment to the territories of literature, histories, religion, militia, and macroeconomics. Such um, uh, non-attachment non um, can be considered an a-territoriality as well, so a basic um, removal from an essential attachment to geographies. And this is why I've used the cloud as a symbol to denote extraterritoriality. So I believe that um, this state of extraterritoriality is implicitly understood and innately enacted by Roma, a people with no welcoming homeland or any commonly acknowledged myth of departure. Beyond the geographic, Roma extraterritoriality is manifest as a perceived non-attachment to the written word, the written word being the seemingly universal convention on which the formalized structures of history are built. So, 
the idea of a non-attachment is, I think, underpins this idea of the nomadic sensibility. Um, we'll leave these cards in if anyone wants to um, pass them around. Be welcome. Thank you. So, Ethel, I'm going to ask you for your first <coughs> card, show and tell, your map. Yes. Um, thank you, Daniel. I, I do want to say what I think was interesting about what you said in terms of the attachment to the written word. Um, we can come back to Gayatri Spivak or to Jacques Derrida and look at the kind of practices against phallologocentrism that they talk about. And I think that, that might be an interesting also way of entry into the, into the cloud. Um, and for me, what I've done, um, Daniel has made symbols, and I've done alternate palmic cartographies, or handscapes. And this one um, denotes what I would say is Romani history. And what I'm thinking about in terms of the Romani history is a notion of encampment, the modalities of the camp its possibilities, its politics, and its history. In the We Roma Reader um, that Maria referred to at the beginning, I argue that, quote, the camp is our history. Our history is one of encampment. We are inextricably linked to the camp and to encampment. In fact, our history is inextricably linked to three principal iconographies of the camp, the gypsy camp, the iconic one, the slave quarters, and the concentration camp. And that's, that's the end of the quote. But it is, in fact, also, I would argue, the present condition for too many of us. Refugee and displaced persons camps, makeshift camps because we are not provided with places to live, and the continual threat of expulsion, and again, a kind of setting up of camp. So what I'm, what I'm looking at here is not the camp as a kind of freewheeling choice, but the camp as that which, uh, from which there is no alternative. So what I've done here, Daniel, is I've put on the lifeline 1,000 years of history. On the knowledge line, I've drawn an eye meaning that even as we're surveyed, as we're watched, we're watching back, we're looking back. And then um, the heart line, I've marked it with love, but I've also marked each of these with the various modalities of the camp. And so here we've got genocide, waves of genocide over the last thousand years, slavery, forced evictions, forced settlement, for sterilizations, firebombing, pogroms, and murder. And for those of you who don't know, just two days ago in Bulgaria, a Bulgarian man shot dead three Roma on the street for no reason. So we have to realize that this is really a condition of our present day. But near the love line, I think there are some other modalities of the camp and encampment that we can think about. Security, safety, home. Right, where one's own people are. And what I've done is drawn, um, here I've got the, the kind of the caravan, right, the various modalities of the camp, the caravan or the vardo in my dialect. Um, the slave quarters um, as a kind of recording of the, the history of slavery that Roma in um, current modern day Romania and Moldova have faced. I've got the tent and I've got the Mahala, the Romani neighborhood. Up above, where the place where one's um, hand lines are in the finger, the creases of the finger, I've made barbed wire, and I've got the concentration camp. Because the, that history of the Holocaust, the Paraimos, marks our history of the 20th century deeply. But I've also got, surrounding it, the Romani flag with its wheel and the, the depiction of the sky and the grass. And then a patrine, um, which is an alternate kind of map formation that uh, traveling Roma would use in order to mark where they were going and to signal it to other, to other Romani people. And that opens up a possibility. 
And then off in the thumb, what I've, what I've put are the walled areas of the modern day displaced persons or refugee camps. And the final thing I want to say about this is um, what we've got with the hand is this is north, this is south, this is east, and this is west. And so with the palmic cartography, what we're doing, west becomes, it's at the very bottom. It's not at the top, it's not the primary space, it's at the bottom. So that's, that's my map, and I'm happy to, again, pass this around. Thanks. So um, you could choose a card, and I will look at that particular. So this is the river, which uh, denotes, in terms of the uh, characteristics of the Roman model, denotes collectivism. <coughs> so this is um, uh, the, the central importance of the family underpins a culture of communal rather than individual emphasis in the Roma, within Roma groups. This is based on the understanding of community as extended family and as such is a recurring expression of collectivism within Roma culture. The accommodation of collective responsibility is apparent in the way that Roma elders are regarded within Roma culture. Senior members of the community often being referred to as aunt and uncle within uh, the community, whether or not they're related. Mm -hmm. And the way in which elders the elders' perspective is valued in the management of communal and family affairs. This inclusion of the voice of experience contrasts the pervasive culture of youth which dominates the individualistic approach of Western contemporary society. So the Romans' acknowledgement of the value of joint endeavour is grounded in survival tactics, a strategy of collectivism of strength in numbers. And this continues to be linked to the situation on the ground, developed as it is in reaction to the violence and discrimination that commonly results from continual attempts toward assimilation and annihilation, attempts despite which the Roma, the Roma population has historically continued to grow. The, the attempts at assimilation which are occurring now across Europe are a continuation of what's been happening for, for many, many years. Both Roma, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. And so, okay. so I think my, 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 my concern is um, sort of part of what is, I think, that we're kind of getting at a bit of very poignant place in the story. So, like, I interviewed you with me, Mark. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought you were telling me to keep quiet. <laughs> Are we, yeah. Uh, no, so, um, I'm sorry to interject with your, um, your, your presentation, but um, because I, I, I kind of, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I feel that we, we're at a point in our sort of global history that, that is um, quite sort of de desperate, and um, I, I, you know, we, we, we sit, we're sitting here speaking about, about, about people that are as, as others, and I kind of belong to, as I'm sure most people probably in this room belong to, categories of, of, of other, and I kind of always wonder when we have these conversations, what, what is the, the, the illustration and what, what, what is the point of us talking about, about, about these situations? I mean, it's, it's, it becomes another sort of illustration of, of sort of social, uh, just uh, social patterning or, 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 or so kind of a social structure that, 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 that's again quite kind of anthropological, and I kind of, I get quite frustrated when I, when I, when I experience that, because I feel like, you know, you know out of this meeting, what, what is the point, you know, out of, out of this? I mean, we're talking to, to quite a homogenous um, uh, continent in, in, a, in, a, in a lot of ways, and, and when, the minute we start speaking about our, our others, it's again still in, in very confined situations. I mean, this, 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 this house, is this barrel, the kunst, whatever? It's a very con controlled, con contained, contained situation. I'm sorry, I'm just interjecting. I'm not really offering any solutions. I'm just quite frustrated and feeling quite kind of radical about. Uh, because I think there's there's more than just uh, one kind of bloodline that's been eliminated. You know, as we speak, I think in Syria at the moment there's there's ethnic cleansing going on in a, at a phenomenal rate that um, it hasn't really been engaged in. Um, 
Uh, and you know, when we talk about, about war, there's, there's something also quite dramatic that's happening with, with soldiers. They, they've been dragged um, and to, to commit the most heinous and, and atrocious acts. So when they sort of sober up from those, um, from those acts, they, um, they can't remember, they don't have, I mean, where, where, where soldiers are raping and murdering children and their mothers and their daughters, you know. You know. Yes. So, so, so there's quite sort of extreme things happening. And I think that, that you know, for, for me still, when we, when we talk about um, uh, the, the global context in, in a way where we can still sort of quote what I call dead white men, and I'm not saying that you're quoting dead white men, um, I think that one of the things I experienced when I came to Berlin was a lot of people were quoting dead white men and I felt Could like I there was no do action. Do you have a question? Sorry, I don't have a really question. No. I just kind of have a desperation. And okay. I think that, that that is sort of what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do. And, and sorry, when I get the microphone, I, I tend to okay. kind of go on a bit. So maybe I should we, stop. We hear your desperation. Um, <laughs> thank, thank, yeah. you. thank you. Thank, thank you for your intervention. Thank you. Um, okay, so yes, collectivism. Right. And now I'm going to choose a card of yours, Ethel. Okay. This one. And we may not get a chance to go through all the cards, so... So to, uh, stop us if we... Um, sure, yeah, okay. absolutely. There's another card for you there. Yep. Okay. So this is, um, again, back to the productivity question. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but at the beginning, when I read the gentleman's palm, I took his money and I'm not giving it back. And I'm doing that very deliberately because what we're talking about is not just a kind of a mystical engagement with some psychic world, but actually, as I said earlier, a form of productivity, of keeping body and soul together, of putting food on one's table. And for me, <coughs> that's precisely what these practices are. When one is deprived of labor market opportunities, of labor market niches, to sort of get sociological on you, this is where one intervenes because it becomes a labor market niche. And so, um, again, what I've put here is, is Marx's circuit of capital, his formula for capital reproduction, the monetary commodity, monetary form, so MCM prime, i.e. The, 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 the creation of surplus value. Um, but I've also put around, on the heart line, body and soul. And because, again, I'm really interested, and I think it's essential to talk about embodiment. We can't, and, and, and to repeat, you know, to say when, when we think about these practices, they're often both unpeopled, but at the same time, pathologically embodied, i.e., objectively embodied, racialized. But also I have hyper-exploitation. And then the question of debt. We talk a lot about debt today, but I guess the question I would turn back from thinking about abject labor practices is, who owes whom? Who's really indebted to whom? And how do we rethink the debt crisis in a different way? And then finally, I've got politics here as a, as a pushback against alienation, evacuated histories, and disembodiment. Um, and the magic M is M prime, is the production of M prime, but again, a kind of unalienated production of M prime. Would anybody like to have a look close up? Thanks. Okay, if you choose one of those cards. Yep. Okay, that's the, the sundial, which denotes um, the quality of cyclicality. Um, so although, um, as I said before, the majority of Rome are no longer itinerant, the influence of a common nomadic past remains significant. And Roma histories are partly founded upon cycles of movement precipitated by economic imperatives, for example, the seasonality of agricultural labor. Uh, my family often traveled around uh, following the work that was occurring in different parts of the country. Um, and this would uh, be a recurring, a recurring um, element in our uh, calendar. So this kind of cyclicality is distinct from linear notions of time, such as those as the chronology through which Western histories are narrated. Contrast between such narrations of temporality are compounded 
by the explicit exclusion of Roma from conventional histories as evidenced by the late arrival of markers commemorating those murdered during their time in the concentration camps, as well as our conscripted Roma dead that died during the wars. Um, so this, um, this was discussed in a, a couple of talks yesterday in relation to the idea of the Western idea of time and history as being about the future, constantly about progress, moving forwards, without really considering any kind of implications of our histories, how our, our histories might come back to influence how we are experiencing uh, the present and also the future. So I think I consider this to be quite a marked um, contrast, this idea that we treat um, our environment, whether it be an environment that we are passing through in terms of my family, let's say, in my, my, my community um, in, in the UK. Um, for instance, um, there was a tradition of uh, making um, willow baskets, willow uh, type of wood, wooden basket, and filling them with primroses. Primroses would be taken from uh, local woods, um, but there would always be enough left in order for there to be some again next year. So this idea of... of um, of history as a series of cycles, I think is um, still quite important within the, the Roma sensibility. Move on to the next card. Mm -hmm. This card for um, any economist friends in the room, and for you, Daniel, is um, the S curve. Uh, the S curve is a is a it signifies the cycle of technology, so it's something again thinking about technology, thinking about questions of innovation, and trying to reclaim them. So this this map of the S curve, I want to reclaim in the name of Romani productivity, in the name of Romani history, and the way that it works is the idea that a cycle of a of a product right or a technology is that it kind of goes flat until it takes off and then it reaches its peak and then it goes flat and another one comes ahead. And I think for what, for me, the alternative to that, the alternative to the idea of a planned obsolescence is actually making something that's old new again. And I think some of the things that you've been talking about are very much along those lines, you know, keeping the primroses, um, but also you know, using things that would seem to be broken and fixing them, using them for other purposes, right? That's, that's again, a practice of people who don't have access to easily disposable commodities constantly. Um, but it's also this making new, this pushing back against obsolescence, recycling. But also, again, I think this question of the future, a kind of alternate, alternate futurity that doesn't depend upon the onward push of, of a capitalist progression or, or, or a neoliberal notion of what the future might look like, which is pretty bleak. Um, and, and so here, you know, I have creating um, and thinking about the notions of materiality that are really wrapped up in creating and in making things. Does anyone want to? Thank you. Do we have time for any more? Or? Yep. Do you want? There's some mics, okay. Do we have how many more? I have three. I mean, yeah. one, one could um, really take a long, a long time um, uncovering um, um, certain ideas that could be of extreme importance for, contem for contemporary in a moment. But I wonder whether, uh, Ethel, you specifically, could you, could you describe what you precisely mean to reclaim the camp? How would anybody want possibly reclaim a camp? And what does it mean for, you know, for the contemporary situation? What does it mean for potential future? I mean, it has, uh, the, the notion of camp has, has, such, has had such a bad reputation and extremely negative uh, connotation. So what do you really mean and how can we use it in situations like, uh, like this when indeed 
um, we sit here in the house of the of uh, world cultures. There are enormous amounts of conflicts going on. Whether it's in the West, hidden, like with the with the Roma Roma community, uh, something we don't want to know, we don't want to hear. But there is a genocide going on mm -hmm. in Europe at this moment, as we speak. And places like mention uh, 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 places like Syria ha that has just been pronounced and mentioned, mm -hmm. something we cannot uh, ignore and one quite uh, uh, need to quite um, uh, seriously engage um, engage with. Mm -hmm. So the question is, you know, where is the politics of reclaiming of certain of these qualities, and how can we from here move forward? Yeah, thank you, Maria. I think that's a really important thing, and I think the first thing front and center, um, as I put in the map, on the middle finger in the top, is the concentration camp. And to say that not only in World War II, in the history of the Holocaust, Romani presence, Romani death in concentration camps was denied for so long. And then again, in the wars um, in the former Yugoslavia, you know, the fact that Roma were in the camps was not something that dominant forms of history talked about. So that kind of reclaiming, I want to reclaim that history because it needs to be told. One of the urgent ways in which it needs to be retold is that, yes, we're in another moment of, if not genocide, then we're certainly heading there. And Roma are again in danger, and if we, so, so my one, one modality of the camp is the concentration camp, because at this moment, we have the resurgence of far-right politics, we have resurgence of violence against Roma, we have expulsions, we have people being shot in the street. And if we don't tell the histories of genocide, of the Holocaust, of the Poraimos that have come before, if that isn't recognized, then it won't be again. And so that's one modality. I think the other side of it, and why I drew the tent, the vardo, the mahala, is because there's also another form of camp. Right? We are a diasporic people. Even those of us who are settled, we're, you know, we're, 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 we're a diasporic people, and to recognize that the that the vardo, the, the caravan, the tent, the mahala, the slave quarters, and in the current moment, again, the refugee camp, have all marked our existence, have all been part of both our preservation, the fact that there are 12 million Roma in two, th you know, more than 12 million Roma, there are more Roma than Swedes, is that right? I think that's right. Um, in the current moment, yes is marked precisely because of this camp and despite the camp, so the two modalities of the camp. But then I think, again, the third form of encampment that I want to reclaim is the possibility of another camp outside of the dominant camp. When Daniel talked about being pushing back against the nation state, pushing back, being not invested in militarism, the kind of camp that is the protest camp, the camp that could have been Occupy, the camp that is, um, the, the um, you know, throughout kind of Europe and the Middle East, the camp that camps out and protests against war, against genocide, against the violence of the nation state, that's the other camp that I'm interested in reclaiming. So you, you're talking about the camp as a sort of archive of knowledge. Absolutely. Which to address in order to rethink possible other futures. Absolutely. What's good art and intellectual practice to do with this? I mean, vis-a-vis, -vis, I mean, if we use mm -hmm. a word such as genocide, why should we be sitting here and debating these questions? Well, I think there are many strategies for tackling uh, the situations that uh, we're, we're discussing here. And um, I think central to the, to the question is, in terms of Roma in particular, mm -hmm. is the idea of visibility. And so, the, that visibility can occur in many ways, whether it be the, um, the encampment, um, which often um, generates a deviant landscape, a landscape which can then be debated uh, through its very presence and its very visuality. Um, 
being here and uh, the, 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 the podcast or whatever that's happening now is another form of visibility. So I think visibility is crucial. And if we can be seen to be um, showing our concern and our protest about these situations in a, as many ways as possible, um, that's the way forward. But I think that all visibilities are relevant, no matter what aesthetic form they take. So to um, privilege the urgency of, of uh, the protest, the protest camp, um, you know, is possibly valid, but it doesn't, it shouldn't have to replace the visibility of the artistic gesture, which I think believe can be as emancipatory as the protest. Yeah, and I think to follow up on that, I think it's also that emancipatory move is about another world, another politics. And, you know, we have a, a module here, what's to be done, right? What, what are the other worlds that we, can, that we can imagine? And part of that comes through artistic practice and, in, and intellectual endeavor. And it doesn't have to be the kind of artistic practice of, you know, the, the high-low, the elitist intellectual endeavor but it's actually just the kind of communication, the thing of making together. You know, and, and Daniel and I, when we were preparing our cards today, we sat for hours reworking them together. And that is an emancipatory project. That's an emancipatory practice, I would argue. But also, I think what we're trying to do is to open up, just to tell these histories, as you say, the visibility, but to also, up other, also open up other possibilities and to really bring politics into it. Now, what do you, what do you mention? I'm reminded of, uh, of, the, of the argument that Boris Groys actually made on the first day of this gathering, talking about the fact that art and politics are actually united through the notion of imagination, of imagining mm -hmm. another future, another possibility, but still, in comparison to politics, art is much more powerful in the sense that politics is only capable of operating in one sort of time, which is the contemporary, the <laughs> present time, while art is capable of operating across various layers of time and perhaps even operates with a delay, but it's the notion of visibility or other, other possibilities that art brings forth. But it's, its capacity to operate across different times, mm -hmm. it's, its political power that's, uh, that's of crucial importance. Absolutely. I wonder whether there is an urgent question here in the room that you would want to pose. Does it work? Yeah. As you've been talking about the camp, I want to add a fourth uh, version perhaps of what Susan Sontag was writing about camp, which is something totally different as counter lecture, something to, to speak of quotation marks sensibility, artifice, studization, theater, sorry, uh, theater, irony, something that really turns this expression around. Does it help you to get some more positive uh, connotation of the terminus of camp? Speaking about like Occupy camps and what David Grabber yes. wrote about counterculture or culture jamming, as Carla Larson called it. Yeah. Just the fourth remark on that. Absolutely. It more in a positive way. Absolutely. The Susan Sontag formation of camp, and the camp is perfect. And it does show the possibility of art. And it shows the possibility of, <coughs> of perhaps making fun of the ridiculous formations of elitism, of, of capitalism, but also of the ultra-right, right? I mean, that opens it up to actually make fun of it. And I think that that's part of, you know, one of the things that we've also been talking about growing up in Romani families is, you know, I, I grew up sort of being taught to make fun of everything. And that camp and the ways in which it's related to artistic practice is absolutely there. And I want to say there's another version of the camp, which I'm not going to talk about, but Paul Gilroy talks about, which is between two camps, i.e. you're on one side or the other, and if you're not on the side of, you know, justice, or if you're not on the side of a kind of politics, then you're already falling down into something else. So. Um, Thanks. Um, I also have a question, perhaps a bit of a theoretical detour, but I quite like this idea that was presented by Maria of a camp as an archive, and I like very much this first um, sort of an 
not announcement, but a narrative that you made of your house as not having any books but objects. And these objects supplied to you uh, a sort of narrative, at least as mm -hmm. I understood it. And I was immediately sort of uh, connected with this idea of Benjamin's uh, essay on, on language, of men and language in general, this idea of the lost language of objects. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that I felt that what you're presenting to us is not that this language is lost, but that this language has lost us as its readers. Mm. And that perhaps at least what you're showing us is uh, an idea of a nomadic reading. But I, my question perhaps would be how in this way do you allow this particular way of relating to an object, perhaps not as a Western subject, perhaps as a other subject or a subject of otherness, but how this presentation to us, does it not put in danger this? Or, or do you find that there is an emancipatory potential, this sort of, of freeing, perhaps not against, but through the laws of the nomad from, mm -hmm. from the war machine, in a way? Mm -hmm. um. so, so, can you encapsulate that in... Um the echo is um, a bit difficult, sorry. Yes. Uh, my, my question is, um, so you have this message that you're bringing yeah. us, which is extremely interesting, but my constant fear is that this message is interesting. We will make it into an object. We will make it into something that will fit in the house of culture, I in see. its walls. Mm -hmm. It will okay. become a sort of a nice I thing see. that we'll look at. Okay. And this is my fear, and I, I was see. wondering... Okay, yep. yeah. Uh, well, <coughs> the main... <coughs> excuse me. The main side of my research... Um, has been to um, examine objects and artifacts that circulate within um, Roma communities. So communities that um, are not um, uh, well. I think an important place to start is the 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 idea of art being quite removed from Roma communities. And as I said earlier. Um, the art as an object in and of itself, as a separate entity to everyday life, I think is not something that's uh, common within Roma communities. Therefore, these objects which are uh, very rich in meaning and narrative are objects which are circulating within the home in a way that's not privileging them over any other kind of activity. So there's a I would suggest there's a kind of um, mm -hmm. a convergence of life and art practices. So artistic practice and the practice of living, um, probably not just in Roma communities, but in you know probably in um, um, a lot of non-Western communities, whereby the objects that are circulating have um, and the objects that are made are. Mm -hmm. uh, embodied with an equal um, importance to the activities of life. Therefore, that raises, in a way, that raises their value beyond the value of the art object because they, they are objects which are communing with the people that live with them and that make them. So, uh, if I understand correctly, you're talking about the idea of taking the idea of these objects or these objects and placing them somewhere else. And I think that brings into question the whole idea of um, the art institution, really, and what part the art institution has to play for um, communities such as the Roma community. And I would argue that, that um, it has probably very little to offer the Roma, com Roma communities in terms of, of housing um, embodiments of um, artistic practice that are, are coming from these communities. Where I think it can be useful is when um, these objects are placed in a different environment in order to um, elicit new meanings from them. So I think in terms of, um, as an alternative, let's say, to a text, these objects can be read, uh, you know, to an attentive eye, they can be read and their meanings can be mined in much the same way that a book can be um, mm -hmm. read. So I think it's an interesting question in terms of what the art institution has to offer or what role it has to play, but I think that at the moment that's uh, a question that um, would apply to society across the board and not just the Roma community really, the relevance of the art institution.
Thank you. And I have one more quick question here. I would like to ask uh, Ethel, uh, because I found a lot of uh, similarities and difference also. Uh, if you, for example, find also these similarities or difference uh, with the huicholes in Mexico, for example, that it's a, a group that lives in one lives in one place and they move, they per, per, peregrinate to another place, uh, which is the desert, and take the drug in order to uh, to talk with the god or to talk with uh, their ancestors. And but in 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 one way that open open up uh, consciousness and in that way to open up to the, to the other. Mm. So I was wondering if you can see these similarities or uh, difference between uh, Romans and, for example, these, mm -hmm. these groups in Mexico. Um, yeah, I guess I, I think I have a couple of responses to that, Alejandro, and I'm sure Daniel does as well. Um, but let me just sort of give two entries. One I'd say, I think the question for Roma, when Romani people, when Roma and Sinti have been what we would, I guess, call nomadic, it's usually been not a question of nomadism for kind of, I mean, that, that, that inspiration, right, that the Huicholes get or that, but it's actually nomadism, again, to go back to productivity, productive practice sort of as a way of, and, and Daniel talked about, right, the, the ways in which families would move with the harvest because that's what you do. Or, you know, growing up, my uncles who paved, who, who paved streets and, and driveways in the winter wouldn't work because you can't, right? So it would be a kind of a cyclical, you do as much as you can while the weather is good. And, and then people, a lot of people would then move to warmer places to do whatever work they needed to do. Or again, with, with you know, the things that I'm sort of intimately familiar with, with my family with horse trading. So a lot of that question of movement really was grounded in productive practice, in labor practice, on the one hand. But I think also then the possibility of opening up is another question. And I think it gets back to the camp and it gets back to the gentleman's question about, um, other archives. Um, and I've been writing about this in my work on modalities of encampment, uh, where I say, you know, I, I make this argument against maybe Derrida's notion of archive fever, right, where he talks about the burned archive, but actually that the, the camp for me, and precisely the way that Daniel's talking about it, becomes another archive, it becomes another space. And so maybe that question about the arts institution, I would turn around and say, it's not that we, we do need for the archive to include Romani histories. But Romani history is Romani artistic practice, Romani productivity, Romani material culture is all there as a critique of and outside of the mainstream institutions. Now at the same time, I want to push back and, and push for that inclusion, but I also want to say that once we start paying attention to that, we open up other possibilities. This is a good moment to um, bring this conversation to more of informal situation, perhaps uh, with drinks uh, outside. There is still a uh, film. There's a group of people waiting for those of you who want to join uh, for Mantia Diavara's uh, film on Edouard Glissant, One World in Relation, which is a remarkable film. Um, thank you, Ethel. Thank you, Daniel. And apparently, this is just a first opening into uh, numerous discussions that we uh, definitely have to have. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.